It gets weirder and weirder as the world loses more and more its moral compass. Let me share with you only two incidents that caught my eye over the past few days, and they might have caught your eyes too. Let me go to Australia first, where the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, the MSO, cancelled an acclaimed pianist's recital after comments he made on the Gaza-Israel war. British-Australian Jason Gillam's performance was no more because the virtuoso wanted to dedicate a piece to the 100 journalists killed in Gaza during the past 300 days. This event might make you raise your eyebrows and then move on by saying that it is just one of those things, and it's only a recital after all. But what about a young Palestinian Gazan father who went to register the birth of his twins and collect their certificates, but discovered upon his return home in Deir al-Balah that a shell had hit their house? The twins, their mother and grandmother had died in the attack. More victims in a war that has skidded out of control. Yet, Despite the obvious daily tragedies in Gaza, the U.S. administration approved a further $20 billion in arms sales to Israel. And at a UNSC session in New York called for by Algeria, the Israeli ambassador parroted a string of excuses about the violence in Gaza. He referred to a number of events, starting with the one at Al-Ahli Baptist Anglican Hospital in Gaza in October 2023. Excuses, by the way, that were debunked later by fact-checkers. He concluded with another excuse, another event, if you will. The young children who were killed in Majd al-Shams in the occupied Syrian Golan Heights. He referred to them as our children whilst everyone knew they were Syrians and their families had in fact refused to meet with Israeli officials following the tragic accident. Why do I start this fresh episode with these depressing flashbacks? It isn't to tug at your heartstrings, but rather to highlight the fact, as mentioned by Daniel Levy, president of the U.S. Middle East Project, that this war has turned into an example of a confrontation between the so-called axis of resistance versus the axis of Zionism. And this is where lies and hypocrisies abound. Destroying a whole strip of land and pulverizing its institutions and infrastructures as an act of vengeance contravenes international law and is therefore a crime actionable at the ICJ and the ICC at The Hague. Yet, as the Palestinian ambassador at the UN asked his colleagues in New York, when will the talk become the walk? I'm reminded here of a couple of quotes by Sir Winston Churchill during the war years when he focused on the theme of perseverance. In one, he said that all the greatest things are simple and many can be expressed in a single word, freedom, justice, honor, duty, mercy, hope. Aren't these virtues being fought for on a daily basis by Palestinians under occupation? And aren't their attempts at freedom to apply these principles being thwarted by many powers and principalities? Mind you, Winston Churchill also said that when the eagles are silent, the parrots begin to jabber. As an Armenian, I know a thing or two about genocide ethnic cleansing, land grabs, and injustice. You can easily check what happened to Armenians during World War I, and then again in the South Caucasus a decade or two ago. In fact, it is happening today at the Armenian quarter of the old city of Jerusalem with a handful of local Armenians fighting off rabid settlers. So I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. This war that is using various methods to ethnically cleanse Palestinians from Gaza is a precursor to what could happen in the West Bank of the OPT. 
Afif Safiye, a former Palestinian head of mission in the UK, said it way before me. He reminded every audience he addressed that Israel has been striving for decades to retain the Palestinian geography and get rid of the Palestinian demography. The difference then with now is that the mosques have fallen, or if you prefer, the erstwhile emperor is naked. Israel, whose UN ambassador boasted only this week at the UNSC that his country has the most moral army in the world, is willing to commit heinous and egregious atrocities in order to achieve the same. Expel Palestinian Jerusalemites from their city of birth by revoking their residency rights. Keep building settlements and outposts on occupied territories. Enter the West Bank, north to south, Janine to Hebron, willy-nilly, and kill anyone who displeases you. Have your government ministers accompany settlers into the Al-Aqsa Muslim compound with Israeli flags and claim their right to the site despite a status quo agreement with Jordan, a Hashemite kingdom that Israel has a peace treaty with too. Also, kill tens of Palestinians and then say that you were targeting Hamas terrorists. The truth is out there for all to see. And the likes of Francesca Albanese, UN rapporteur, repeats it ad nauseum. As did Omer Bartov, the Israeli-American historian this week, when he focused on Israeli societies today and argued in a powerful long read in The Guardian that Israelis had to choose between existence and justice. And in their minds, they opted for existence and forsook any justice for Palestinians. What he could have added as a textbook corollary flowing from this choice is that in their quest for existence over justice, Israelis have become increasingly more violent, less moral, as they defend in their majority, but not all of them, I would add, such unjust choices. In fact, Israel is turning into a society that is gripped with despair, but at a loss on how to carve a way out. In a sense, Israelis are incapable of prioritizing the saving of lives as a policy goal. This inability, this indifference, appears to have extended from Palestinian lives to Israeli ones, from the presumed terrorist, all Palestinians, to the Israeli hostage, all hostages. Read Mayrav Zontzin, the ana analyst at Crisis Group International. Her recent article in The Intercept tells you a thing or two about Prime Minister Netanyahu's banalization of evil. In a French digital bubble I wrote recently, I described the attitude of Israel, its army in Gaza and its settlers in the West Bank as savagery. A friend from Leeds texted me, and suggested a neologism that describes Israeli immoral attitudes. She called it Gazaism. Yet, and yet, despite a plethora of such statements, the US administration and Congress continue to provide a fig leaf to Israel. So a tragic story that began with the Nakba or great catastrophe in 1948 continues untrammeled some seven plus decades later with a durable ceasefire, nothing more than a shadow in the horizon, and Israeli hapless hostages suffering further incarceration. The US administration is not as helpless as it pretends to be. All it needs to do is adopt UN endorsed sanctions or even a provisional arms embargo to send a message to Israel that there is a limit. Yesh gvul, as some Israeli peace activists would tell you. I said it in my previous YouTube episode, and I'll repeat it here and now. I have no idea if we are heading for a ceasefire or a regional war, but perhaps possibly a war of some definition in the next few days, unless there is a political metanoia, 
a conversion of hearts and minds that reconfigures the realities of the region. But let me conclude with two thoughts that I hope you'll mull over when you're thinking of the Middle East. One comes from Martin Luther King Jr. that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. Mind you, many of you listeners to this short episode will recognize various interpretations of this statement from Spinoza onward and might even dismiss it with a bemused shrug. But the other thought I share today is a natural segue from my first sentence in this episode where I said that it gets weirder and weirder as the world loses more and more its moral compass. Well, this second thought completes mine and comes from Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. How can one be well when one suffers morally? Indeed, will it be pusillanimity or magnanimity? What is the choice of world leaders from Saudi Arabia and Egypt to the USA and Germany? The first problem for all of us, men and women, is not to learn but to unlearn. That is the difficult challenge facing many of us today.